So, hi, my name is Andrew Swirlick, and I'm going to be talking to you guys about microservices today. So before we really get into it, I just wanted to see kind of a quick show of hands who has even heard of this term and feels like they have kind of an idea of what it means. What's that? An idea? Okay, so everyone is at least basically familiar with it. So I think I'll go ahead and start just kind of with the, the high level definition, and then we'll sort of get into the why and where I'm coming from, from the, for this. So microservices is this idea that you want to build systems of small composable parts uh, as an alternative to building one big system to kind of manage everything in your business. So oftentimes the sort of, uh, it's talked about as monoliths versus microservice. So monolith is one big code base, one big database, one big application. Microservices, each one has its own code base, its own database, its own deployment script, etc. And then you set it up so that these services all interact through a set of very defined channels. Uh, so you can compose them together and run them all on the same box or uh, communicating about the same data very easily. So obviously the next question is why would you do this? Why would you build one big app, as opposed, or excuse me, a bunch of small apps as opposed to one big app? Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about where I work and why we're choosing this path and then use that to kind of talk about some general principles as to why. So I work for a company called Herman International. Uh, we uh, do personality assessments focused on the HR and employee development space. And so this means we have a lot of different parts of our business that are impacted by technology. We need tools that let our, uh, our staff actually set up teams so that they can take the assessment. Uh, we need something to actually deliver the assessment to a user and record their results. We need something that lets us do reporting on those assessments. We need things that do shipping and fulfillment because sometimes they want us to print all the reports and put it in a nice packet and ship it off to them. Uh, so we have all these different pieces that are related, but in many ways are very different and have very different concerns and very different goals and interact with our data in very different ways. So when we sort of started looking at how we were going to work the technology in this space, you know, one choice would be to build that model to build that thing that tries to be everything to everybody. Uh, and it quickly became very apparent that we were going to have lots of problems with data kind of competing for purposes. So we, in some places we would want to structure the data better for reporting, some places better for operational. Uh, and so we were trying to you know, man manage and weigh these trade-offs of which, what do we do to compromise in this situation. Uh, we were going to have problems where different uh, parts of the application had different opinions about the schema itself and whether things should be normalized or flattened. Uh, and it became very quickly apparent that a monolith was not going to be a great approach. So that's why we started looking into this idea of microservices, uh, so that it would sort of allow us to build each application separately and make it so it was only concerned with the parts that it really cared about. So the shipping application was really focused on shipping and fulfillment. Uh, survey delivery was really focused on getting the survey out there and being as performant as possible. So this kind of this kind of same scenario, I think, plays out in a lot of companies evaluating these ideas. And, and most, a lot of companies go towards microservices for kind of the following couple reasons. So the first big one is ease of maintenance. So one of the things that I was talking about there is this idea that with a monolith, you often end up with places where different applications are competing with each other, or different parts of the application are competing with each other about how your data should be structured and accessed. Uh, so you might have a reporting part that wants everything very flattened uh, so that you can report on it quickly and do bulk reports. But the operational part would prefer everything to be really normalized and, and done in like a, you know, a third normal database structure. Um, you also have places where these different parts may ha rely on sort of hidden implicit dependencies. So they're sharing classes, they're sharing utility methods, they're sharing things that you don't always even realize they're sharing. And so you end up dealing with the problem of regression issues frequently, right? I mean, this is, you know, how many people have worked on large code bases, right? You always run into more regression issues the more code that you're dealing with. So if you can keep your code base smaller, even if each, you know, even if you have a lot of little code bases, it does ease that maintenance for inside of the app so you don't have to worry about different parts of the application competing for data in different ways, you don't have to worry about some of the regression issues, etc. The second big thing is scalability. Uh, so if you build a big monolithic app and you get to the point where you're getting enough load on it that you need to move it to a second server, there's no way you can scale just the part that's getting heavy load, right? So if you build an online ordering application, you're going to have a bunch of different pieces there. You're going to have something that actually takes the orders from the customers. You're going to have something that does price management where administrators can come in and change products and prices. 
Uh, but the part that's really going to get the load is always going to be that customer facing part, the part that has to do with actually placing the orders. So if you need to scale, you can't just scale that customer facing part when you have a monolith. You have to scale the whole thing and you end up wasting a lot of resources running this price management stuff on five different servers when it really could be fine if it was only on one. And then the last real big advantage is being able to deal with autonomous teams. So if you've got a big enough business and the technology impacting enough of your business, and you've got this big monolith, you're going to need to add more people to help your development. And eventually, you might be at the point where those people even have to be broken up into their own individual teams. Uh, you can't have just one team of six or seven people, you mean maybe two teams of six, three teams of six, and something like that. If you're dealing with a monolith and everybody's working off of the same code base, then you really have to coordinate all of these teams very tightly. They can only deploy when everyone has finished their code. Uh, so you've got to schedule it and make sure that everyone kind of finishes at the same time. And when they inevitably don't, teams are going to have to wait or they're going to feel rushed. Uh, and then when you deploy, it becomes a big deal. You've got to merge all this code together. Uh, you've got to push it up to the server, cross your finger that everything's okay, deal with the inevitable fallout, etc. If you take a microservices approach, and each app is its self-contained code base, it has its own kind of deployment setup, deployment scripts, its own database, then it becomes a lot easier for your teams to act autonomously. Each one can kind of deploy when it's done. Uh, you have much less communication because they coordinate and they interact, all these apps interact and coordinate through very specific defined channels and contracts. So as long as you're only changing the internals, it doesn't really matter you know, uh, team A doesn't care that team P pushed a new version of their code today. So it allows these teams to act autonomously and be a lot more productive. So that's why you see a lot of people going the microservices route. Uh, and why the, a lot of the organizations who are interested in this, this is the kind of stuff that they are, kind of pain points that they're dealing with and they can decide to, to take this. So what I'm going to look at next, and really how I'm going to end up structuring most of this talk, is explore a series of what I call microservices concerns. So these are sort of things that you have to have set up from an infrastructure level in order to do microservices in a productive way. Uh, you know, you can't just start building a bunch of slapdash apps and throwing them up on a server and hoping everything works well. You have to kind of have these core pieces in place so that you don't have apps interfering with each other's deployments, so that they are communicating in a way that is fault tolerant, uh, so that, you know, essentially it works and is, you don't end up with a situation that's even more complex than a monolith. Uh, so basically the way that I'm going to take the rest of the talk is we're going to look at these concerns one by one. I'm going to talk a little bit about two things. One I'm going to, what is what I'm calling the hard way. So this is the way that you might see in a sort of uh, enterprise microservices implementation. A company that's got a DevOps team, it's got some serious infrastructure maintenance and management going on. They can afford the time and the resources to do it right and to reap all the benefits of microservices. Then I'm going to contrast that with what I'm calling the easy way, which is kind of how we're doing it at Herman International. So we've taken some shortcuts. Uh, we've done some things that make it easier for us to get going. It means we don't get all the benefits of a full-blown microservices setup, but it puts us in a really good position to scale to that when we're ready to. Uh, so that's kind of the, the basic structure for the rest of this talk. And so those four concerns that we're going to focus on are client routing and discovery. So basically how your clients, your phones, your laptops, your people typing things into a web browser, how they get to your services. Uh, the next one is common client and protocol concerns. So these are things like how do you make sure that every service has all of its connections over HTTPS? How do you handle authentication across all these services? How do you handle common error message handling? All of these sort of things. The third is cross-service communication. So it's the notion that these, these applications, they have to talk to each other. Otherwise, this would be a trivial problem. You just build each application separately and don't worry about it. So how do they communicate and share data? And then the last one is deployment. How do you deploy these things in such a way that deploying one doesn't break the other? That they're isolated, that they don't interfere with each other, uh, and that you can kind of let each team manage its own deployment. So we're going to take these one by one uh, with the kind of structure that I mentioned of the hard way and then the easy way. So the first one, routing. How does a client get to the right service, right? So if you have a client, uh, you know, a web browser, a phone, whatever, and you've got a bunch of services, uh, different scenarios are going to require them to talk to different services. With that online ordering application, if you're dealing with actually placing an order, you might want to talk to the order service. If you're dealing with um, administrative price management capabilities, you're going to talk to that price management service, etc. So the naive approach would be for each client to have to be aware of every service and where they are. 
Uh, so this would mean in your phone app, like your mobile app, actually programming service URLs um, and information. It would mean for a web browser that the, the user would actually have to know the URL for each service uh, and remember to bookmark it or type it in. Uh, and so that's obviously not a great approach. So generally what you see uh, a lot of people doing is introducing something called an API gateway. So this is essentially a single service that sits at the front. It captures all the requests. Every client just sends requests to it. And then it will proxy things on to your individual services using the information in the request, using the, you know, the slash, slash parts of the URL, so everything after the domain, using the parameters, whatever, to decide this request needs to go to this service. Generally, uh, that uh, API gateway is a simple web server. Uh, like Nginx, like Apache, like HAProxy, uh, that basically has some configuration and some scripting inside of it that does that, uh, that piece of discovering where the services are and then proxying the user onto it. So that's, that's pretty common across all microservice implementations, common across the more formal ones and common across the one that we use at Herman International. Where it tends to differ is how that API gateway does that. How does it figure out where those services are and send the user to the right one? So in the hard way, you generally see the people using a dedicated service discovery tool, um, plus that web proxy, plus that web server we talked about. So those are tools like Console, Zookeeper. These are things that they're separate applications. They have their own databases, uh, and they basically are designed to store information about all the services you have running in your environment, store information about which ones are up, which ones are down, uh, which ones have gotten requests recently, which ones haven't, and then give you a simple API to query it to say, okay, uh, what is the best service to send something to right now? Um, so uh, the, the way it generally ends up looking is uh, the request comes into the API gateway. The API gateway is going to make a call out to that service discovery tool, generally over DNS. The service discovery tool will look at its full database of all the services that are out there. Uh, it'll say, you know, if you've got load balancing configured, it will look at that and say, okay, this is the best one to serve this request right now. And then the API gateway proxies it along to that service based upon the IP address that it got back from the service discovery <coughs> tool. So the benefits of this approach uh, are that you can do a lot of uh, kind of more f powerful fault tolerant stuff, right? These service discovery tools, they're designed to let you configure load balancing inside them. So you can even do sort of round robin type stuff where you can have it give you a different service back every single time uh, and rotate through all this, you know, so if you have that online ordering application and you've got seven instances of it up and running, uh, you can have it rotate through all seven of those so each one gets equal load. It can also do health checks, so it can be constantly pinging any of your services to see if they're up. And if one of them is down, it'll stop sending requests to that service. It'll tell you that that one's down, and it'll take it out of the rotation. You can also do kind of more complex routing scenarios, like, like we talked about, that, that round robin, that uh, even kind of uh, you know, more complex things for, for specific scenarios where <coughs> you need certain kinds of requests to be serviced by this instance of the server rather than this instance, etc. The drawbacks, uh, it's a little more complex to set up. You actually have to set up the, the tool, console or Zookeeper. You've got to do health checks on it to make sure it stays up and running because if it goes down, uh, basically your entire infrastructure is not working. Um, you also have to make sure that it's configured right and keep that configuration up to date as you add and remove services from your application. So, uh, you know, you'll see this as kind of a common pattern with a lot of the hardware stuff. Most of the drawbacks deal with how much work it is to set up and that you really need somebody who kind of owns that application or that process. So now let's take a look at how we do it. So the easy way, we use a couple different tools. Uh, we use Docker, Nginx, and Nginx Proxy. Uh, so these, these three tools, it seems like maybe seem like a little more because we've got a couple more things, but these are things that we're already using in our ecosystem for other reasons. Uh, the basic idea, uh, if you aren't familiar with Docker, Docker is what's called a containerization technology. So what essentially it lets you do is run applications inside of these lightweight, isolated containers. They, in practice, look a lot like virtual machines, uh, but they don't take up as many resources because they don't try to virtualize your entire hardware stack. They just give you sort of an isolated file system and network stack. Um, the details of it aren't super important for this discussion, but the basic idea is it lets you run all these applications in an isolated fashion, and it gives you a central place where all the applications are registered. 
Uh, so as a consequence of using Docker, we can actually query the Docker daemon itself, and it will tell us all of the applications uh, that we have running on that server. Nginx, the web, uh, the web server, so that's the common piece, it's just the API gateway. And the last one is a tool, goes by two different names, I actually meant to correct this and realize I didn't, um, Nginx proxy or Docker Gen. Uh, and it's essentially a small application that runs inside of its own Docker container and talks to the Docker and gets all the list of applications and generates a configuration file from a template. So all we have to do is pipe in this template and then it will loop through the list of applications and add information for each one of them in according to the template. So what that allows us to do is basically, oops, swiping the wrong way, my bad. What that allows us to do is we have this, these Docker containers uh, that feed into the Nginx proxy Docker gen application. It generates for us an Nginx configuration file, and then we have the Nginx server watching that and reloading every time that configuration file gets created. Um, so ultimately, it's, it's a, a similar setup, but we don't have kind of this separate app that we're calling out to. Instead, every time a new service uh, is added to Docker, uh, we regenerate the configuration file and restart our web server. So the benefits of this is it was a pretty easy setup, uh, particularly because we were already using all of these pieces of our infrastructure. We were already using Docker uh, in order to run things in a very isolated fashion. So we got kind of the registry part for, of it for free, and then all we had to do is write this template file up, uh, start uh, Docker gen up, and uh, then uh, have it generate an Nginx configuration file for us. Um, so that, that you know, took a lot of that, that hassle coming from like setting up console or Zookeeper out of the equation. Uh, the drawbacks, though, are that uh, it only works on a single server. Uh, and in newer versions of Docker, there are ways you could get around this, but we haven't explored that quite yet. But in general, Docker kind of, you know, you can run Docker on multiple servers, but you can only kind of query the information about what's running on a single server at a time. Um, so when, uh, uh, so, so basically we can't kind of move this onto multiple servers or do any sort of load balancing yet. Uh, which is not a huge issue for us at the level we are, uh, but it definitely represents a, a drawback and one of the trade-offs that we're kind of taking by taking this approach. The other drawback is we have to redeploy, um, we have to sort of uh, re like, tweak uh, our Nginx configuration file for each new service that we have um, in order to kind of handle a couple of uh, scenarios about uh, how, how that template works and loads. Uh, so it does mean that we redeploy the actual API gateway every time we add a new service. Um, which, if you're dealing with a service discovery tool, you, you don't necessarily have to do. Um, so ultimately, uh, not, you know, it, it definitely eases our setup, and as long as we're in a space where we don't need to scale to multiple servers, it works great. Um, the other big thing, though, is that it allows our apps to function as if they were in that full-blown microservices environment. They still act the same way. The only thing they're doing <coughs> is getting requests proxied to them by a web server. Uh, so if the time comes when we need to scale, we just have to add, you know, add console, add a service discovery tool, and we don't have to rewrite or change any of the code in our individual applications and services. So we'll take a look at the next one now, this idea of common client concerns. Uh, so this is sort of this idea that there are things that every, when every client connects to your service, they want to have guarantees around, or you want to guarantee. You want to guarantee that the connection is happening over HTTPS. You may want to guarantee that they're authenticated. Uh, you may want to guarantee if there's an error, that that error is going to get displayed the same way, constant, consistent error pages, etc. So all of these things are things that you don't really want to implement in every single application, because that would be a lot of duplicate code and a lot of duplicate effort. You'd have to buy a lot of SSL certs, right? There'd just be a huge number of hassles with that. So again, uh, the trick, uh, in fact, in this case, that API gateway that we use for routing uh, can actually help us solve a lot of these problems. So uh, what we can do, basically, is handle all of this stuff at the API gateway level. HTTPS is really easy to handle. All you do is set up the SSL communication on the gateway, and then all the communication inside of your data center where the gateway talks to individual services, you can do unencrypted. Even if you need it to be encrypted, because maybe you're dealing with cloud setup or really, really sensitive data, still at that point, you can do self-signed certs in the back end in, in, in kind of the inner service communication, and the only cert that you have to buy and get signed by a root is up in the, uh, on that API gateway. 
Air handling is also really easy to handle at this level. All you have to do with most web servers is if they send a request off to a service and it gives an error back, you can tweak the kind of proxy and configuration to display the same error page every time. So that can all get handled at the gateway as well. The piece that is a little trickier and you see some differences in how people implement it is authentication. And so um, in the hard way, you generally see, uh, or you sometimes see this implemented with OAuth. So OAuth, if you're not familiar, is a authentication protocol uh, that's often used. You've, you've probably come across it if you've ever gone to a page and signed in using Google or Facebook or Twitter or any of those things where they sort of delegate the authentication and authorization out to uh, some sort of third party. The way that it basically works is you have uh, your client and you have an authorization server represented by that top box and you have a resource server, so a server that actually has a thing you want, like a list of products or a list of books or whatever. Uh, the client makes a request to the resource server. Uh, the resource server says you're not authenticated, so then it redirects them over to the authorization uh, server. The authorization server takes their username and password and then gives them back a token. And then the user takes that token and sends it back to the resource server. And then the resource server takes that token and checks it with the authorization server to make sure it's valid. Uh, so there are a couple drawbacks, or there is one big benefit to this, is it allows this concept of an app ecosystem, right? OAuth is why Facebook can do things like have apps that you can grant individual permissions to that app inside of it. Um, so that's, that's really the main reason you would use something like OAuth. In general, though, it has a lot of drawbacks associated with it. Uh, it's got a somewhat complex setup. You've got to set that authorization server up yourself. Every app then has to be OAuth aware. They have to know about OAuth, and they have to know how to find that authentication service. Uh, and there's a lot more cross-service chatter. So you saw with the, kind of all the arrows there that you know the client has to talk to the authorization server, the resource server has to talk to the authorization server, uh, kind of lots of chatter just going back and forth between the apps. So the way we handle it um, is, a, uh, is a little more straightforward, and in many ways I think we'll probably scale with this even beyond uh, where we are now, because the drawbacks are significantly smaller. Uh, so we use kind of signed cookies or signed tokens that are generated at that API gateway. So the basic flow is that if you're a client, uh, we have that API gateway now in front of the authorization server and the resource server. So when you log in, you make a request that goes to the authorization server. The authorization server at that point will pull up your information, for, or excuse me, the authentication server, will pull up your information from the, the database based upon the username and password you gave. Uh, it will find out you know, what your user ID is, what any information is, and generate a encrypted token um, that they'll send back and form a cookie. So basically it'll take all that data, it'll use a secret key that's only on the server, and it'll sign that, uh, that data to generate an encrypted token that it sends back to you. Uh, that encrypted token looks like, uh, from the client's perspective, like gobbledygook, and it looks like a random string of numbers and characters. But the key thing of it is that it can be decrypted later to get that original data. So once you've got that token, you'll make another request to the resource server. And at the API gateway level, we'll take that cookie and we'll decrypt it. And if the data looks good, if it looks like what we originally sent you, uh, and it hasn't expired if we had a timestamp or anything like that, uh, then in that case, the API gateway will just proxy the request on to the resource server. So there are a couple benefits of this uh, over the, the old way. First is that we only hit the database once uh, on login and not on later requests. Because we can store most of the data that we care about related to the user uh, in that cookie, we don't have to necessarily validate their username and password every time. We don't have to, uh, you know, we can even store some basic information like their email address or some sort of information about the permissions they have to save up on database requests. The other big advantage is that the apps implement, implement no authentication logic. Devs just don't have to worry about it. Uh, instead, all you have to do is, you know, uh, you have to do authorization logic still. So you still have to check, now that I know who this person is, how do I, you know, are they authorized to do this action? But from an app's perspective, all they have to do is look at the token uh, and pull the information they need out of it in order to check if the user is authorized, being that user ID or that email address. Uh, the drawbacks are, are not nearly as significant. Um, so really the only main one is you can't do that kind of app ecosystem, uh, which you know, very, most businesses probably don't need to do unless you're a Facebook or a Google or a Twitter. 
Uh, and then any mobile apps kind of have to be specifically written to store and manage that token. In the mobile space, there are a lot more kind of libraries and tools for doing OAuth. This kind of authentication, you have to kind of roll a little bit of your own in terms of storing and managing the token. Um, but, you know, as long as you're writing all the mobile apps that interact with your services, that's not a big deal. You know, it's only a big deal if you're dealing with third-party apps. Uh, and that's certainly not something that we're doing at this point in time. So the next piece, cross-service communication, um, is probably the biggest and the most complex where we'll end up spending a little more time. Uh, how do services actually talk and share data? And we're going to break format here a little bit, and instead of talking about the user in the hard way, first, I'm going to talk about what you shouldn't do no matter what. I'm going to talk about the ugly way. Uh, so this is synchronous and request response. And this is the way you see a lot of services communicate and talk with each other, right? It's the classic uh, REST communication over HTTP. It's where service A uh, needs information, so it makes a query to service B uh, and waits, then waits for a response. And the problem with this is it creates a lot of issues. So let's go back to that example of the online ordering application, right? So let's say you've broken up uh, your web store into an online ordering application and a separate price and product management tool. Um, so if you have this model, the online ordering application is going to have to query out to the price and product management tool to get information on prices every time there's an order. So what happens when the price and product management system goes down at 2 in the morning? Suddenly you're screwed. Your boss is going to be calling you up at 2 a.m. telling you that China and India can't place any orders and you're losing thousands of dollars and you have to fix this now. So you've created this tight coupling where the failure of pretty much any application in your stack can lead to the failure of your entire set of services, which is really not something that you want. Uh, the second problem is it can be pretty hard to trace requests through this. So here you have a pretty simple scenario, right? Service A talks to service B, but you may have service A talk to service B which then needs to talk itself to service C, and then to service D, and then suddenly you have kind of these requests going all over your application, and it's really hard to tell who needs what data and what applications depend upon each other, uh, which can lead to that same problem of, you know, hidden failures where one application goes down and suddenly you're surprised to find that everything in your system is down. The last big problem ties into all this, it's scalability. So we, one of the reasons we wanted to do this in the first place, right, was so that if I have a lot of people placing orders, I don't have to scale my price management system. But if every time I place an order, I've got to make a call to the price management system, then I haven't solved my scalability problem at all, because I've got to scale both those services at the same time. So I've separated things out, but still have really the same level of complexity and most of the same challenges. So if synchronous communication is not the answer, then it's got to be async. But what does that actually look like, right? So if you're thinking about it, you know, how, how does the online ordering application know what the prices of things are? Um, you know, just having async communication, how can that solve it? And it helps if you start to model the problem away from computers. So if you think back to, you know, the dark ages when you couldn't have an online ordering store and you had to actually physically call somebody up and place an order with them, uh, how, would, how would this process get managed? Uh, so you would talk to some sort of customer service representative and you tell them what you want. And then they, they definitely wouldn't hang, you know, put you on hold and call their manager and ask all the prices. Instead, they would generally have a list in front of them of all the common products and prices, and they would tell you what those things were and place your order for you and, and you know, get you through the process without having to involve everybody else. And then whenever prices changed, somebody would come around and they would give everybody a new copy of the list of products and prices. So that's the kind of model that we want to do on the computer side, too. Instead of having it be when an order is being placed, going out and getting real-time information from another service. Instead, we want that price management application to tell us whenever we have a price change and to send that information onto the online ordering application so it can update its own copy of the data. And this has a very fancy official sounding name. It's called data duplication over events. So you start by kind of flipping that model. Instead of thinking about it to as service A needs this data that's in service B, you think about it as service A cares when this data in service B changes. And you publish an event that service A, that, so your, your price management application publishes an event that your online ordering store is listening for. It takes the data out of that event and updates its own local copy of the pricing information. And then uh, it can do its ordering on its own. So this solves pretty much every one of the problems that we are dealing with, right? We don't have any tight coupling. If your price management application goes down at 2 in the morning, nobody cares. Uh, because nobody's going to be logging in trying to change prices. 
your online ordering application keeps chugging away with the local copy of the data, the, the cache, if you will, it has in its own database. Um, and nobody really knows that anything's wrong until you know, 10 a.m. when some administrator actually logs in and tries to change some prices. So you've changed a you know, business crippling emergency into something you can deal with after your copy break. Better traceability. So if you're dealing with a situation where these events are being published whenever data changes and people are listening for the events, it's a lot easier to trace because uh, instead of sort of each request generating uh, kind of a numerous other requests, you can sort of log the events as they happen and you can log a list of who cares about those events, subscribing, if you will, to the events. Uh, and so then it becomes easier to trace which applications depend upon data from other applications. And then lastly, better scalability. Just, because, just for the same reason that the price management application and the online ordering application are no longer coupled, we can scale them separately. The uh, price management application doesn't know how many orders you're taking in a day. It's not interested in that information. It's not getting a request for every order. So you can scale the, price, the online ordering store as much as you want and not really worry about the price management application. So this is the basic idea of how you do asynchronous communication. So how does that actually look in practice? What tools and pieces do we need into place to actually make that work? Uh, well, the first we'll talk about the hard way. And the hard way is generally you have a dedicated event bus or messaging system. So these are systems that are basically designed to do exactly this. They're designed to have subscribers who are listening for events, and they're designed to have publishers who are publishing them. Uh, some of the ones that are out there are Kafka, RabbitMQ, ZeroMQ, there's a, there's a whole host of them, uh, but they all kind of work the same way. They have their own uh, data store that stores information about who's subscribing to events, uh, and, they have, and you basically publish to them by uh, pushing out over uh, you know, either uh, a uh, HTTP or uh, other kind of endpoint. Uh, and then they'll find every client that's, lit, uh, that's, that's subscribed to the event that you published, and they'll send that request along. <coughs> uh, so the benefits of a system like this uh, is that they are fault tolerant generally. They're designed to run across multiple servers in kind of a clustered fashion, so that if one goes down, the others can step up and continue taking events. Uh, and they're also optimized for extremely high loads. Uh, if you're dealing with like millions of events per second, uh, you want <coughs> one of these dedicated storage systems, or dedicated event bus systems. The drawbacks, it's another system to support and maintain. Uh, but the other big drawback is this concept of dual rights. So uh, if we go to that price management online ordering application thing again, uh, if the price management application changes its price, then it has to do two things. First, it has to save the information to its own database. And then it has to publish to this other external system. Uh, and if either one of these things goes wrong, you have a chance to end up with an inconsistent state, right? So if you fail to save your data <coughs> but publish, then all of your online ordering applications are going to have information that does not match your own database. And if you save your data but fail to publish, then all your online ordering applications will have the wrong prices. They'll have the old data still there. So the alternative that we're using right now is building our uh, messaging system directly into our database. <coughs> Excuse me. So what this looks like is we've actually written a, a little sort of library called QBus. It's built on top of a background job library called Q. So if you don't know what a background job library is, these are things that you see in most uh, web application frameworks. The idea is there are certain events that uh, you don't want to do inside of your web request because it's expensive and the user's going to have to sit there and wait for it. Uh, so like sending emails is a good example, complex calculations, whatever. So you often will set up a background job uh, kind of uh, framework so that when those requests happen, uh, the only thing that happens inside of the web request is you write to a jobs table, and then you have a separate application or separate um, thread running in the background picking those items off the jobs table and doing the hard work, actually sending the emails, actually doing the back, back end calculations, etc. Uh, so this actually works really well as a starting point for an event bus, because that's ultimately what we want, is for some of these things to get processed uh, separately and to have it sort of watching for new things being added to it. So we took the background job library, and it came with this notion of a jobs table. So we added this concept of a subscribers table. So we said a table that basically says this application is listening to this kind of event. And there's a row in there for each application and for each, kind of, uh, and each event that they listen to. And so then... The way that this works together is each publishing application, uh, when they publish an event, looks at the subscribers table, finds every subscriber that cares about the kind of event that it's publishing, and then queues up a new background job specifically for that subscriber. 
So from a visual perspective, you're basically dealing with a publishing app. It looks at that bottom subscribers table. It sees two things that are subscribing to the event that it's publishing. And then it pushes two new background jobs. And each application will pick up its own background job and run it. So the benefits of this uh, is there's no new system. It's built into the existing database. We don't have to maintain or add anything on top of it. Uh, we also solve the dual rights problem because we're doing this inside of the same database. Uh, then the drawbacks, uh, the biggest one, is that all apps actually share the same database. Now we mitigate this in a key way by essentially having them share the same database but not share any of the same tables or data. Uh, so we use particularly a feature in Postgres called schemas which allows you to kind of namespace tables in such a way that they're completely isolated. Uh, they can still there's ways to reach in and grab each other, ta each ta you know, for your tables and other applications to grab each other's data. But from a programmer and development perspective, we don't do that. We sort of soft enforce that each application should only deal with its own data, and the only way they communicate is through these shared event bus tables, the shared jobs and subscribers tables. Uh, and the other big drawback is the logic for using those subscribers and jobs must be implemented in every app. So in our case, it takes the form of a single Ruby gem but it means that we're stuck on the Ruby stack for anything that we want to use this jobs table. And then if we wanted to um, move to a different stack, uh, we'd have to re-implement that logic in Elixir or Node or whatever. Um, so you just have to kind of, you know, so that's the, the other big disadvantage of this strategy. But in our place where we're, we're only using the Ruby stack because we have a small development team and aren't at the point where we can be polyglots yet, uh, and uh, we're, Ultimately, we don't have enough load that it, it's a problem that we're all on one database. This setup works really, really well. So the last piece that we're going to look at is deployment. Uh, so how do we set it up so that we can deploy things uh, in an isolated fashion um, uh, and each team can kind of deploy its own stuff whenever they need to? Uh, so the, this is actually something that's pretty similar between, you know, there's not a big difference between the easy way and the hard way. In general, they all have kind of the, the same key things. That you, if you want autonomous teams, you need automated deploys. You can't have people logging in and mucking around on a server. Uh, you need it something that is scripted and automated as much as possible. Uh, and generally, the way you see that done is you deploy on check-in. So you have your source control system, and you wire it up so that when you check into a specific branch, it automatically builds the software and deploys it. So the way we have it is if you check in the dev branch, it builds and deploys the development environment. Test, QA, master, production. Uh, and this is something, you know, a pretty common set of scheme. And then the big part is you really need isolated apps. You need it so that deploying one app does not interfere with another. Uh, and so you see a lot of different ways to do this. Uh, VM, this is one. Uh, Docker is the other one, and that's the one that we're heavily using, and a lot more groups are moving towards. Uh, so the advantage of a, a setup like that is that you know each application can be deployed. It runs in its own container, it runs in its own stack. It doesn't matter if you upgrade certain system files in your own Docker container for your app. You're not going to mess with or break anybody else's uh, application who's using the older versions of the system files. So some sort of isolation in the form of a container or a VM. So the hard way, uh, you generally set up a dedicated server to handle this automated build process, right? You set up a, something like Team City, like Jenkins. Uh, these are servers that can monitor your source control system, can hook into them, and when they see changes, will kick off build scripts or build processes and deploy code. Uh, alternatively, you can use cloud services. So there's a lot of services out there right now, like CodeShip, Drone.io, Travis CI. Uh, all of them that basically will do the same thing as those dedicated build services, but they're hosted in the cloud. Uh, so you're very easy to set up and configure. All you basically do is point it at a repository and then give it a script to run uh, for actually building and deploying. Um, and, so the, and then you're good to go. And those scripts can look like, uh, you know, uh, generally if you're using Docker, the nice thing about it is it sort of comes with the notion of a deployment script in the form of a of a Docker file. If you're using something else, you can use Capistrano, you can use Ansible, you know, whatever tools you already use to write automated deployment scripts um, and hook it into, you know, either, either way, the dedicated build server or cloud build services. So that really gets us through those four big sets of microservices concerns. Uh, so kind of to cap up, I'll sort of summarize where we are at Herman and, um, and, and how this sort of easy way that we've chosen, the trade-offs and the, and the benefits that it's given us. So 
uh, we have a bunch of small applications that all talk asynchronously. Uh, that's probably the key thing any microservices implementation is going to need. It's that notion of asynchronous communication um, and that, that kind of drives all these applications. Uh, we have automated deployments that are tied to our source control system so that it's very easy for us to update a service without affecting any of the other services. It's easiest for us to add new features via separate apps. So when we get a new product, we can immediately build up a, you know, when, when we, or when our leadership decides we're going to offer a new product or a new assessment, we can immediately build that out as a totally separate app. Uh, and we don't have to worry about the choices that we made in previous apps. We don't have to worry about if we chose a framework that turned out to be a bad <coughs> idea. Uh, we don't have to worry about the data structure that we decided worked for that app, but might not, might not work for this app. Uh, it's kind of very easy to get up and running on new products and, and ideas. Uh, it's also very easy to experiment with different approaches from app to app. So we can decide that we're going to try this framework on this small, relatively unimportant app. Um, it's you know, not a huge critical part of our business. If it doesn't work, that's fine. Uh, we haven't committed to it. In the next app, we can try something different. Uh, so it makes it easy to kind of experiment, test upgrades, test new frameworks, uh, and not kind of get that stuck in that situation where you've got a giant monolith that you're afraid to ever upgrade anything on. Uh, we have a single server and a single database, but we're ready to scale with really minimal app changes, right? So if we get to the point where we need to scale, it doesn't mean we have to rewrite any of our applications or services. It means we need to replace that API gateway with something a little more sophisticated. It means we need to add a dedicated event management system. Uh, but it doesn't mean that all those individual applications have to change at all. It's all about infrastructure changes at that point. So that's really it. Um, so that's kind of, you know, that's basically where we are at Herman. And I think, in general, if you're at an organization of kind of a similar size and you're interested in microservices, but you don't feel like you have that dedicated infrastructure team of people who can manage some of that, these strategies offer a potentially good way to start experimenting with it uh, with kind of low entry point costs and letting you kind of get your feet on the ground, get used to writing apps this way. Uh, and ensure that your apps are scalable and can go to a more formal uh, stringent microservices implementation uh, once you've got the resources and the, the need. So, thank you. Any questions? So, you have, um, you know, the easy way, um, which makes sense in a, in a lot of cases. And the, <coughs> it seems to me like the easy way, the, the, you're, that's where you... And, you grow out of the easy way. Exactly. Right? You, you scale out of it. You, you need to handle more requests or whatever. Where, so you've got the service discovery and the event bus, and I don't know, I feel like there's a third one that, that was like... The common client concerns, which really was about authentication, and that one I almost feel like you don't grow out of. Right. Unless you're going to go like a Facebook or Google route, uh, and you need like an app ecosystem where third-party uh, developers can write apps that interact with your data, and you need the way for a user to give permissions. Uh, some people use OAuth even when they don't have those scenarios, and I spent you know a lot of time both researching for this talk and when we were considering going that route, trying to figure out why. And I never really got a good explanation. I always felt like they were making things more complicated than they need to. So, what do you see as being the, the thing that you're going to grow out of first, the database event bus or the? Uh, I think we'll grow out of uh, load balancing first. I think we're not going to because you know data we, our database server is intentionally more beefy than than the other ones, and those are generally designed to be fairly performant. Um, so I, I have a feeling we'll probably grow out of um, the API gateway, and we'll need to get something where we can load balance that API gateway, um, uh, particularly because even, even if we don't get to the point where we have enough load from a disaster recovery and fault tolerance perspective, right now we're sort of in a manual failover space. If anything goes wrong on one of those servers, I've got to actually log in and sort of take down uh, the primary servers and fail over to the replicas. If we, uh, but if we can you know, get a load balancing setup, then it all becomes a uh, hot failover that doesn't require any manual intervention. So what would you have to do in order to be able to use different servers as opposed to have to run this on a single server? I think you'd introduce like a service discovery tool like console or Zookeeper, like I mentioned, because they are set up to console and Zookeeper. What you would generally do is so each API gate, each ver you would have multiple servers that are serving as an API gateway. You would have multiple servers hosting services, and you would install console on each API gateway and run it in a clustered fashion. Uh, so that if an API gateway goes down, it still has a copy of all of its information. And then you'd have to uh, have, handle a process that whenever a new service came online, it registered itself with console. So if you've, or, 
So it might make sense to do that rather than something intermediate with load balancing. If you get to that point where you, you know, load balancing becomes an issue, you might perhaps it makes sense to move to the point where you could have uh, services run on different machines. Yeah, exactly. That would be, I mean, the moment we are interested in load balancing is the moment that we would, we would sort of move from the easy way to the hard way. I have a couple of questions for you. They're both related to each other. Um, I'm really fascinated by the way you guys are applying Postgres schema. Uh, I guess, I mean, I don't really have any context on how you, what your products do and how they work around it. But every time I've ever worked with Postgres schema, I was working with a product that had a structure definition but wanted different data for each thing. So I'm, I'm assuming that if you guys are using it this way, that you're not actually having shared data across these services. No, they're not. The only way the data is shared is in the form of uh, events, so that if if uh, you know our, our reporting tool needs information about an assessment that was just taken, it gets that because uh, the assessment delivery application publishes an event, uh, and then the reporting tool grabs that data and copies it to its own data and in its own database structure, so that it can structure the data in the way that serves its purposes best. But so the rest of because you're using schemas, the rest of the tables <coughs> are the same. No, no, no. The each each schema will have its its own structure, totally unique structure. Um, in theory, you could you could do it without schemas. I just think it makes particularly it makes working with something like Rails a little more pleasant because you don't have to define like a table prefix for everything. Um, uh, because the way schemas work, uh, it works like a you know for those who don't know, it works like a namespace. So that if you're using a certain schema, it will first search. Uh, in that schema for the table. So if you're inside of like a schema foo, it will, and you search for the table bar, it will search for, first search for foo bar, and then search for the public bar. Uh, but you don't have to type when you're doing the select statement. You don't have to type foo.bar, you just type bar. And the fact that you're using the schema, it infers that it should give you foo.bar. So ultimately you wouldn't need Postgres and schemas. You could just do, you know, you could do table prefixes where each app would prefix, prefix the table with its own little thing. But that's just, you know, then that, that makes it a little harder for to set up and manage because you've got to remember to do that on every app. The reason I'm asking is I, I work with microservice structures all the time and one very large project I'm working on, they want the same data shared across all of the different services. They're all doing different things, they're massaging it and doing it different things on different ways. Some are putting it in, some are manipulating it, some are reading it out. And so I was really curious that you were using the schema in that capacity. So in our situation, one problem that we have is maintaining structure across all those services. Right, and that's one of the reasons why we don't try to share all that data is because then you've got to have one app that is the master of the structure in the schema. Um, and so then you kind of break the, you break the whole autonomous teams promise because every team that needs a schema change has to go through the team that owns the database. Um, and so we, we really don't want, I mean, I'm sure, you know, if the, your business requires a situation like that, then you have to find a way to work around it, but ours doesn't, and we really want to avoid that. So you, um, it, it seems like this is useful when you're not actually sharing that much data between services. Like if you're sharing a lot of data, you've got a huge data duplication thing, you've now created all these extra events sending across, and then if you, and it also seems like it doesn't work in real time if you need real time data. Like if your shipping app needed to know the actual price, this wouldn't work because that async event may not have gotten processed at that point in time. You can't guarantee, you, you can because you're in the same database, but if you're not in the same database, yeah, you if can't you're, guarantee you're, that. Yeah. So this is specifically for non real time apps where you don't have that much data or where you're willing to take the hit of like basically duplicating, I mean, if you've got several terabytes of data you, that you have to like transfer over constantly, that would, wouldn't work. And, and that's a question of service boundaries, which you didn't really get into. So oftentimes, if you've got apps sharing a lot of data or needing real-time access to their, each other's data, you have to ask the question, why are these separate applications? Um, so, you know, th that's a problem when you're building microservice uh, applications we didn't even talk about. How do, you, how do you decide when to carve something off? Yeah. Uh, and in many ways, 
it, it helps if you if you are using this model and using the asynchronous communication model to use that as your sort of guide. So if I'm having to chatter a lot asynchronously and or I need real time data, then maybe this is not a good thing to be a separate service. Maybe these two things need to be together because they're so they require such tight coordination and communication that they're really one in, in the same kind of business process. Another way to think about it too is it often helps to model directly off of how your business is run or or how your business should be run which is not always the same thing but um so you know thinking about it in terms of real world events thinking about it in terms of who is the master of this data uh you know who which department owns the price of things which department owns the, is accountable for this kind of thing and structuring some of the the services uh along those lines and using kind of real business events and real concepts to help uh, work with your domain experts to understand how to break these services down. How do you deal with the, um, so you're running um, microservices all the way down the stack. How are you dealing with your client side UI? Like, is it, is it just completely separate UIs and completely separate frameworks? Or do you have a common UI that ties this all together? Um, so it, at this point, we rely sort of on that part is the part that's probably the most immature about this. Um, we we don't have you know we sort of rely on some some common uh, gyms that actually have the the branding inside of them. So they rely on all, everyone being on the same stack. I've thought about things like having the like common CSS and JavaScript files for their kind of core to the brand and, and UI hosted at the API gateway so that everyone could access them directly from there and serve them just as static assets off of the web server. Um, I've also seen, uh, uh, I've, I've seen people do where you build things, you know, if you're building primarily a client side app, then you almost have your client side app is just a bunch of static files served from one application and it's pulling in everything from so so these microservices don't each service doesn't really have a UI, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. and so that's another way to handle it if you're willing to build a primarily you know so you you end up kind of having like a monolith that is all JavaScript, um, but but because it doesn't have any of that server side logic it doesn't have to do database things and because you can compose JavaScript in slightly different ways. Um, then it's then it's easier. I've also seen people have essentially that API gateway will will have something in front of it, uh, or one of the things that it'll also do is kind of build composite UIs, where it will build a page where different parts are proxied in from different areas. Yeah. Um, so you either have that's in the API gateway or in like something that sits right behind the API gateway. Uh, that handles kind of composing together a UI. That's pretty tricky though, because you have to sort of handle, you know, you don't want to, you have to handle, you know, making all these web requests happen at the same time, streamlining them so they're not too non-performant, dealing with failed requests so that you display, you know, the error message on the part of the page that's pulling from this other service, et cetera. Yeah. So, so I, that's a, that I don't have a great answer for you. And, you, and, that, and that probably means then, for a lot of these scenarios, you probably don't get to, Experiment with different front-end frameworks because at, at the, at, by the time you get to the front-end, they all have to be kind of tied together. Yeah, if we're going to use the, you know, I mean, we, we experiment a little bit because we're we're the only things we really have to worry about are like really core-level brand elements. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, if you have a, a more tightly integrated brand or more tightly integrated UI, it's definitely more of a challenge. Yeah. So I have another question for you. I mostly wanted to bounce this idea and see what you think. Um, one of the projects that I'm working on that works with a lot of these microservices, we actually don't deal with the first one that you talked about at all, the routing. Mm -hmm. We let DNS handle it. We've got, like for example, there's an API, there's a web portal, and then there's this whole processing engine that doesn't really connect the web except through APIs externally. And they each run on their own subdomain. They don't have, there's no, the routing is the mobile apps connect to the API, the browsers connect to the portal and all that. So it completely eliminates the first problem because they all scale individually. It's actually why we built it that way. We realized we needed the API to be able to scale pretty significantly while the web portal wasn't actually really doing anything yet, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see any problems with that kind of, with doing that kind of architecture? Because in what I'm seeing, I kind of eliminated one of your pillars in fact. So I think HTTPS, I'd be curious how you guys handle that. Um, and maybe wild, you don't. Wild card certificates. Wild cards? Ah, okay. So, and that was something we didn't want to take that approach, um, just because the uh, the 
the potential security or we have like with the data we're dealing with because it's sort of a personality survey some of our customers are super sensitive about it and the risk with the wildcard cert is that you know if you get access to it then you can impersonate any domain so it kind of gives gives a, a larger footprint to the attacker so we didn't want to take that route but yeah if you're willing to do wildcard certificates you could avoid that um, I think the uh, the other advantage is that we can handle things like authentication at that uh, gateway level. So the, the gateway ends up being, it's not the only approach to handle the client routing problem. Um, uh, it's the only one that, that I talked about because it, it ties really closely with what we were doing. Uh, and I think that's in part because of how that gateway can help us handle some of the other pillars. I think it also helps us too from a, um, because we actually, you know, we don't have like a single portal that client like users actually connect to. It helps us to have like, uh, you know, have like a slash URL structure that's just more readable for some people. Uh, and it also means that we don't have to worry about um, setting up as, you know, we, we kind of, we don't have to set up as much of DNS management um, uh, on an individual level. I think the other, I guess the other, um, the other thought process around it too, yeah, it was mostly, I think that in our case, because we didn't have that service discovery tool in place, because, you know, we didn't want to have to update our DNS records manually every time we might change uh, a server for all of these different URLs, it was a lot easier to have kind of one domain and then be able to chain everything off of it in terms of slashes. Now, we use console as a DNS server. Yeah. So, that, yeah. There's actually that's like that's one of it has like that DNS API basically. Yeah. Anything else? Um, so, on your on the um, coordination with the the cookies, mm -hmm. you're basically using that to you're storing like the user ID in there. Right, and then each individual service runs its own session, keeps its own session information. It doesn't keep its own session necessarily, but it does its own authorization. So the API gateway gives you this session. The API gateway checks that it's still valid, and then it will pull out like the user ID or the email address or any other information that um, services might need, and that will get sort of proxied along to the service. So the service okay. can then say, okay, I know, you know, they have, still have to worry about authorization because that's going to be different for every service and we can't generalize that. But they don't have to worry about authentication. They always know, they can assume that when I get a request, I can pull either out of a header or a cookie, however you implement it, uh, I can pull uh, the user's information. So, but, so you're storing all the session information then in the cookie itself. In the cookie, yeah, encrypted so that it can't be tampered with. And do you have any problems with like additional network traffic because of that? Because I imagine if you start storing session information in your cookie, we don't it's store really wrong. that much. Okay. I mean, generally, you try to limit it to kind of like the core things you would need to each application would need to identify a user, like a, U a UUID or an email address or a username, uh, maybe like you know a, a first name, last name, uh, you know. But it's ultimately going to be no more than like five or six fields. Okay. And then, and then any, any then if an app needs to store more in their own session, they can manage their own session from that ID. Yeah, right. They would do either database sessions or if they have in memory sessions or or whatever. Um, yeah, they would they would sort of use that as the the kind of key to manage it on their own. And is there a reason? This is a totally separate thing. Is there a reason for Qbus? Um, you said you did it all in Ruby. Was there a reason why you didn't just implement it via triggers? So that when something gets inserted in the database, it gets inserted over the jobs? Because we already, um, I think in part because we already had, or because the, the Q library was already there and it had exposed kind of like a lightweight API that we could hook into. And because I'm more comfortable in Ruby than in Postgres, but I've thought about um, definitely implementing our thin kind of Qbus layer in the form of triggers because that would help alleviate the porting problem. Yeah. And then it would be interesting to see if there's a way we can implement the entire um, Q library in the form of, so essentially create a background job library that entirely works off of triggers. Um, but I don't know, that would be a little trickier because um, there's some threading things that, that happen in there. And you sort of, I don't know if you could entire, you could do sort of some of it, but it would be hard, you know, it's still in each app, you'd have to implement some sort of basic threading thing that would read the table, that would um, use, kind of ensure that different threads aren't grabbing the same jobs 
uh, and Q happens to handle a lot of that. It, particularly, it uses the PG advisory lock, which is essentially a way of doing application locks in Postgres. So you're not locking any particular data. You're just generating arbitrary locks that other uh, applications can check on and choose whether or not to respect. Thanks, Andrew. No problem. Thank you. Thank you.